Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Thomas Hurd. Um, as Natasha said, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics. And today I'm gonna to talk about our thesis-based graduate program. So um, I think the sort of first question um, I'll focus on is why uh, choose the Department of Molecular Genetics for your graduate studies? And I think one of the things that sets our department apart is just the sort of sheer size and quality of our faculty. We have uh, well over a hundred faculty, many of whom are, are real sort of world leaders in their respective fields. And so one of the great benefits to doing your graduate studies in molecular genetics is you'll have a huge potential pool of people um, with whom to work. Um, not surprisingly, given the size of our faculty, we also uh, have a huge range of um, research areas uh, in biology. Um, we, we try to roughly divide those into six areas. So we have people working on genetic models of development, development and disease, such as myself, to people studying molecular medicine and human genetics. We have people really delving into the nitty gritty of sort of cell biology and even sort of protein structure. There's no department at the University of Toronto that is a, specializes in microbiology, um, but uh, it turns out that most, uh, therefore, of the microbiologists at the university are in molecular genetics. So if you're interested, for example, in how viruses, say the coronavirus works or bacteria work, I think molecular genetics is a department that you should really consider. We have a great strength in functional genomics and proteomics. Uh, and importantly, we also have a huge depth of expertise um, in computational and um, systems biology. And I think this is an area that all graduate students really need to, to, to get a, a, some grounding in um, uh, as, as we move forward um, in our data-driven world. And in fact, we have a, a stream that specializes in computational biology, and we teach all of our, all of our graduate students computational biology. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, our research is uh, dispersed across six different nodes, um, all right in the heart of Toronto within sort of a five to 10 minute walking distance from one another. So we have people in the Medical Sciences Building, we have people in the Donnelly Center in the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, which is uh, in the Mars Building. Many of the researchers at SickKids are members of our department. Uh, so, so the same is true about the Lunenfeld. And then we also occupy two floors of the Mars West Tower. Uh, and in each of these research nodes, there are really cutting edge uh, equipment and facilities. You, you, you would need to do any of the experiments you want. So we have, you know, um, you know any, anything you would need from super resolution microscopy to robotics to um, cutting edge mass spectrometry. Um, so essentially, I think that within the department, um, equipment and facilities are just not limiting. We can do anything, um, anything anyone else can do. Okay, so um, given the size of our department um, and the faculty, um, you know, you can imagine it could be hard to find the right lab to work in. Um, and to facilitate that, uh, we um, have pioneered a rotation system. And this, I think, is a real selling feature of our program because um, it's relatively unusual within Canada. And so it works in the following way. Um, when you join our program um, in September, you typically rotate in three labs, five week rotations before you end up choosing the lab that you're ultimately going to do your uh, graduate studies in. We find this is the best way to ensure that students get to actually try to sample different environments so that they can make educated decisions. So ultimately they're placed in an environment that will ensure that they thrive and succeed. We're really committed to the rotation system. We think this is really the best way to ensure the success of our graduate students. So what is it like in molecular genetics? Um, well, I, I'll first just say our, our student body is typically very diverse, um, international. So we, 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 we seek out international applicants um, and Mojin students are really high performing. Um, but, but, but I think really one of the, really great things about MoGen is just how kind of collaborative and um, community focused uh, we are. So uh, our students have really, are really, I think, um, to credit for this, they have organized and have created a really active, vibrant graduate student association. So though we're a big program, when you enter the program, you'll have uh, support with your peers and your colleagues. Um, they produce sort of uh, newsletters and career and social events. 
uh, we have a yearly retreat. Um, we haven't had had it in person because of COVID the last few years, but typically in Aurelia, where we all get together and talk about our science. And we have things like sort of sports teams and stuff, again, to sort of create um, a sense of community and so that our graduate students are sort of immersed in the Mojang community. Um, so what do, we, what do our, our graduate students do when they complete their degrees? Um, well, the answer is they do a tremendous number of things, of course, um, as you've heard, just a whole range. From the uh, thousands PhD project, though, we have some data tracking actually the numbers. So I'll give you a few quick uh, just highlights. So it turns out that the majority of our students go on to do post-secondary education. Uh, many um, end up doing graduate um, postgraduate uh, work. Um, of those, uh, the major outcome, the most frequent uh, end career stage is actually a tenure track academic position. So about 25% of those end up getting securing tenure track positions, which is remarkable. Um, the sort of second major uh, career path for Mojang graduates would be the private sector. And here, the vast majority, I think it was 67% end up working in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. But there's a range of different career options after doing your, your graduate study. I just want to give you a sense of where most of our graduate students ultimately end up. How do we ensure the success of our graduate students? Well, we've been really sort of actively trying to make sure that that um, we um, sort of educate and empower and enable our students to ultimately be successful. And we do this by having uh, monthly career and networking um, events. We also have a um, yearly symposium and we engage our sort of alumni in this and we really work toward trying to sort of provide opportunities for students um, to succeed ultimately. So we, we have a sort of active um, career development program that, um, you, that's totally available to any of the graduate students in our program. So our, our uh, again, I'm speaking very specifically about the thesis-based programs. And uh, typically students enter uh, our graduate program as master's students. Um, those are students that have not previously enrolled in a master's program before. And then um, you can either continue through your master's um, and the typical time to completion is 2.7 years or in your second year, you could reclassify into the PhD program. Alternatively, we offer a direct entry PhD stream, and those are for applicants who have not previously done a master's and have an average of A minus or higher. So if you know you want to do a PhD, uh, that's certain, then you will enter the program um, as a direct entry if you meet the minimum requirements. Um, instead of uh, doing a reclassification into the PhD uh, program, you still do the same exam, it's just called a qualification exam, uh, just to make sure that you're sort of up to speed. The average time to completion for a PhD in molecular genetics is around uh, six years currently. Uh, of course, within this uh, direct entry, we also offer a computational biology track for those who have the appropriate background and are really focused on sort of high level computational biology. So our course requirements, and I'm just generalizing here, so uh, I, I encourage you to visit our website for more detail on this, but uh, master students um, or, and, uh, and PhD students will all take uh, two core courses within their first year um, that focus on sort of uh, general sort of genetics, um, genomics and, and proteins. Um, and then they will take a, a course on computational biology. And then we have a colloquium where we invite speakers from all over the world to come and you get to interface and ask questions and they discuss their research. It's really fun. We also, um, our students take um, student seminars where in the first year you'll present your work in a small group uh, and you'll sort of be guided on how to improve your presentation abilities. And then in the next year, you then present your uh, work to the broader student community. Um, and then a master's would end there with a, th a thesis um, exam and the production of the thesis. Our PhD students have the same requirements, except in addition to that, they have to do a, 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 a second seminar, uh, which is um, in their fourth or fifth year. Uh, and then two topic courses, which are typically small seminar-based type courses of six weeks um, in a very specialized uh, area that's often uh, relevant to the sorts of work that they're doing uh, in their PhD studies. 
like all departments across the faculty of medicine, it's a harmonized agreement. If you enter into our program, we pay you. <laughs> um, the amounts don't matter so much. Um, essentially, everyone is, um, master's students are essentially given a living allowance of $21,000 and um, PhD students, either domestic or international, are given about $23,000 um, a year. And that's again, harmonized across all the departments in the faculty of medicine. And so if you're interested in applying, um, I really encourage you to visit our website because it has all the very detailed application procedures listed here. Um, applications are submitted electronically to SGS. We have uh, three deadlines for application, November, January, and May 1st. And that's all deadlines for the September, I should say 2022 start date, I'm sorry. You can only apply once per cycle. So, you choose the deadline that um, is going to give you the best chance. We don't have quotas. You're not going to miss a spot. If you're a qualified candidate, then you will be offered a position. And I encourage you to choose the deadline that uh, that sort of will optimize your chances. Although if you know, you're a strong candidate, it can often be um, better to apply earlier because then you sort of may have more information about kind of what options you have. We also offer a, um, a January start date. And for the January start dates, the um, application deadline is for September 15th. Although this is not um, an option for those that are entering the computational biology stream. That is just um, for September entry. Uh, what does your applicant application look like? Well, um, we, you know, uh, all applications have five components. First, you start with a letter of intent. And typically in that letter, we want you to explain why you're interested in doing graduate studies and and then and then elaborate why the department of molecular genetics typically you would mention a few faculty members you were interested in working with potentially um, and then i think uh, you need to highlight your previous research um, and educational experience we're not looking here for a life story we don't need to know sort of your full biography we just want you to sort of focus on these questions I should note here that if, for instance, you don't have research experience or there's some other factor that has influenced your um, trajectory or academic career, this is the point to mention it. You can explain this in, to the grad, to the um, admissions committee. Uh, we look for sort of, uh, essentially we ask you to provide your transcripts. And here, you know, we're really looking, um, you know, you have to have a B plus or greater average. I think that's a minimum SGS requirement, but we're looking for sort of, outstanding um, um, academic performance, particularly in relevant courses like genetics, biochemistry, molecular biology, and um, often um, in the sort of upper year courses in your last two, two courses, or last two years of courses. Um, you know, we think that having lab experience is really beneficial. And we, um, we, we really strongly encourage you to get lab experience. And the reason why we do that is because if, if you don't have lab, you know, it's, it's hard to know what you're getting into unless you've actually experienced it. And so we feel that if you've experienced working in lab, you know, ultimately what you're going to be doing. And so we really encourage that. Now, in, in previous years, we've, we had required this, we no longer require this, because we, we realized that um, COVID has made things very difficult. So if you, for some reason, haven't been able to gain lab experience, either due to COVID or, um, other personal circumstances, you really just need to justify that in your letter of intent to make clear to, this, to the admissions committee um, why that is. But again, I, I strongly encourage lab experience if it's possible. And then we need two letters of recommendation, ideally from a faculty member who supervised a thesis or supervised your research work. Also faculty members who know you in courses are good, um, uh, good people to ask to submit letters of, uh, of reference. And then uh, lastly, we uh, ask for you to submit your CV. Okay, uh, I, think, I think that's probably what all I'm gonna say now. I, 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 would, I would say that I, I, if, you wanna, if you're interested and you wanna learn more, please visit our, our sort of website and our social media and check out our website. Please check out our G, uh, GSA. I think, I think I always encourage any student who's interested in doing graduate studies at Mogen to talk to current students. You can always email me and I can always put you in touch with students if you have questions. And you can follow our students um, and the department on our, uh, on our um, Twitter and Facebook and so on and so forth. And my email address is here. So if you have any questions, 
I'm happy to take them now, but I can also, um, of course, um, uh, uh, email you and we can arrange a time to meet. Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, Q and questions. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull them up. Yeah, if everyone put their questions in the Q and A or chat for Dr. Thomas Heard. So I'm not sure. There are two open questions here. I'm not sure if these were. I think those from previous. From the previous, yeah. Any questions? Oh, there we go. Yes, yes. So the admissions committee will focus more so on your last two years than uh, your first two years. Um, so I think it's really important to um, really excel at the relevant courses in those two years. So yes, indeed. It's a kind of, I think it's most, uh, it's, it's a kind of, most of the admissions committees um, focus on these. Um, I think your research experience, when you say unrelated field, I think it might depend on the field itself. Um, you know, I, I think it's useful to have research experience in something that could relate to something you would do. Um, I would qualify this and explain this in your cover letter and uh, if you think that the research experience you've gained, even if it's an unrelated field, will um, it will, will will help you in your grad studies? Explain to us why. Um, yeah. So I'll read the question just so everyone knows what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm a life science student and I'm interested in the computa uh, computational biology stream. What recommendations uh, do you have to help me strengthen my application? So uh, this is a little bit more specialized um, and. Um, Tim Hughes is in charge of uh, applicants. I think what you need to what you need to show is that um, you have a grounding in sort of more uh, quantitative um, fields. So we need to know that you'll be able to do the higher level computa computational biology necessary. I would say in your instance, uh, perhaps reach out to me. Uh, and I can sort of guide you a little bit more specifically. Uh, I can also put you in touch with um, Tim, should that, should that be, be helpful to sort of give you a, a better sense of, of what, what, is, what is necessary. Okay, another question. I hope that's helpful. Uh, please just ask again, should, should I not be answering? So in my opinion, is an MSc or a PhD better in molecular genetics? <laughs> well, there is no, one is not necessarily better than the other. I think that if you're uncertain about whether you want to do a PhD or a master's, then you enter in the master's stream. And then during that time, while you do start doing your master's, you will then be, be offered the decision to reclassify into the PhD stream. I think it depends. If you really love research and you're passionate about it, then a PhD can be really valuable because it gives you the time to kind of really develop a research project. If it turns out that you maybe like research, but you perhaps want to go into industry and do something a bit more um, applied, maybe a master's uh, would, would be better. It really depends on what your, your end goal is. Um, but many of our students, the majority of students enter as master's students. And I, from anecdotally, I would say that many of the students don't actually know ultimately when they enter, if they're gonna do a PhD. I think more than half do end up reclassifying Many also end up um, just completing the master's and that's also, that's great. So <laughs> one's not necessarily better than the other, but um, they both have advantages and disadvantages. It really depends on what you want to do and what your interests are.
I'll just add one um, while, while we wait, if there's no more questions. Um, we, there's a, a change to our program that's just been implemented. It is on our website, but I, I'm not sure it's widely known. Um, we previously required for international students a sponsorship. So you had to seek sponsorship within the department. For, the, for, the, for this year, at least, we're trying an experiment where we've waived that requirement. So you don't require sponsorship to apply, at least as an international student. Um, we're, I think we're trying to reduce barriers for international students that way. So I just want for those that are international students, that's something to consider. Um, so I, I, someone asked, I hope to go into the intersection between molecular genetics, bioenergy, bioengineering and synthetic biology. What types of experiences do you think I gain? Um, I mean, I would say in like the genetics, because we have a really uh, quite diverse, should I gain? Yes, of course, um, a quite diverse range of people doing different things. I would say that, um, you know, certainly um, there would be potential labs that would be working kind of at those interfaces um, that you could work in. So um, the, experience doing a master's, for instance, or a PhD in those environments would potentially suit you well. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't work at the intersection of, <laughs> of any of those things myself, so I, I can't be any more specific. Uh, again, reach out to me if you're interested, and I can always forward some of these more specific inquiries to appropriate people in the department. I hope that, I hope that somewhat helps answer the question. There's still some time for more questions. Another one? Uh, okay, uh, the question is, what tips do you have to help decide between a PhD and a master's? I thought those who, who go into master's would end up, um, sorry, I thought that those who go into master's would end up going in, uh, into getting their PhD. So, um, you know, again, in our program, you enter as a master's student typically, and then you have the option to reclassify after your first year into the PhD program. So you don't need to make that decision before applying. You can make that decision while you're in the program. I think you should decide. I think that once, if you don't know already, which is perfectly normal, you would enter as a master's, and then you would, you would get a sense of what it was like to do to do a PA, to sort of what, what it's like to do research. And at that point, I think that that's the type of experience you would need to make that decision. Typically students who are really passionate about a research pro project, I think are really good candidates for the PhD program because that's, you know, they, that's what they want to do and they love to do it. But of course, not everyone, not everyone is, that, that, that's not the case for everyone. And for some people, it's, it, it is just, it just makes sense in that it suits their goals to do a master's. Um, I don't think it's, we certainly for molecular genetics, we don't require you to make that decision um, until you enter the program um, after your first year. So I think you should gain some experience uh, and then um, see, see, how it, see how it's going. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that answers. Okay, I see one in the chat. Should we have a re re uh, research projects in mind before we apply for a PhD? So again, uh, in molecular genetics, you would enter as, if you enter as a direct PhD student, you still undergo the rotation system. So you will still rotate in three different labs. So I think that you don't, and if you enter as a master's student, you still rotate in three different labs. So it's nice to sort of think about the type of research you're interested potentially in working, but you don't actually need to know. And what we find um, is the vast majority of applicants to our program are focused on a few areas, say cancer biology and stem cells. Um, but that once they actually start rotating in different labs, 
that they see, oh, you know, this weird model organism is really cool. <laughs> you know, like a, a planaria can regenerate indefinitely, like, wow. And then that captures people's attention. So I think it's a good idea to look at the what's being done in the department. Um, but the rotation system allows you to actually experience what it's like to be in different labs. And that I think often changes people's minds. So, so you don't know. Um, so, so yeah, you don't need to know the project. I think the beauty of our rotation system is that you enter and you get to try out a few things and then you, that allows you to really make an informed decision about what you're ultimately going to work, work on and, and who you're ultimately going to work with. Okay. Um, as an international student, can you apply as both a direct entry PhD and a, a, a master's? So I think the answer to that is yes, but almost all our, 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 our international students apply as a direct entry PhD. And that has to do with the tuition costs. You will not pay tuition costs, whether you're a master's or a PhD student. But if you're a PhD student, a direct entry PhD student, then your potential supervisor will not, well, the, your tuition costs will be um, this, roughly the same as a domestic student. However, if you enter as an international student, as a master's student, your tuition costs are considerably higher and so that, that just makes it much more expensive for your potential su supervisor to sort of pay your way in the lab. So we, I think, typically encourage international students to apply as a direct entry PhD student. If you want to do a master's, you can apply as a master's student, um, as an international student, but you would need sponsorship in that instance. If you're applying as an international student into the direct PhD stream, you don't need sponsorship to apply. There's a big difference there. So if you if you're international and you and you want to apply to our master's program, you need to obtain sponsorship ahead of time. That is a high bar often, so you'll have to figure that out. If you are applying though as an international student into our direct entry stream, no sponsorship in the first instance is required. Okay, as an undergraduate student, there are a lot of research topics I'm interested in. For example. Uh, biochemical signaling cascades and disease, CRISPR, Cas9 delivery, non-coding RNAs. How do we narrow down our interests? Again, and that's that's normal and actually great. I, I, I'm glad you're thinking about all these options. I think the best way is our rotation system. You get a bunch of different opportunities to actually be in those labs. You know, you could go to the Davidson lab and work in anti-CRISPRs, you know, the world leading lab in anti-CRISPRs and explore what that was like. And maybe you'll come away from that thinking, all I want to study is CRISPR-Cas9, or maybe you'll come away thinking, oh, that's great. Or you could go and study non-coding non RNAs in the Krauss lab and a similar experience. I think you want to experience them and our rotation system allows you to do that. So I, I really, um, I think that you know, you should read and start to think about potential options. Um, once you gain acceptance into the program, then you can also start to think about who you want to work with and start to try to make contacts with people um, so that you can get placed in those labs during your rotations. Okay, uh, another question. If we want to be reclassified as a PhD student after entering the master's programs, are there any requirements? The No, the requirement is that you... Um, you do your, you pass your uh, reclassification exam. So all students that enter our program, either as direct entry PhD students or master students, if they want to continue in the PhD stream or reclassify into the PhD stream, will have to do an oral exam. So if you enter as a master's student, it's called a reclassification exam because you're reclassifying into the PhD program. If you enter as a direct entry PhD system uh, student, it's called a qualifying exam. And this is an oral exam. You'll reproduce, you produce a report um, and sort of discuss both what you've done uh, in your first year and a bit, and also what you intend to do for your PhD thesis. And then you will be examined by members of the department um, as well as I think an external examiner as to whether or not you're sort of up, up to it. Um, these are rigorous exams and they're, I think, particularly rigorous in molecular genetics. Um, that said, most students pass. Uh, if you fail the exam in the first instance, you will be given an opportunity to redo it likely. Um, so I hope, I hope that clarifies that. I know it's a little bit confusing. Um, if there's any ambiguity, please email. Um, 
Okay, so is sponsorship only needed for the molecular genetics MSc, or is this the same for all departments in U of T? No, uh, departments vary uh, considerably. A uh, good example, <laughs> I think, is that um, biochemistry previously didn't require sponsorship, and now they do. So it depends on the department. You're going to have to look at each department um, to see to see what um, their requirements are. I think, I think I've answered the current one in the queue. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Again, please reach out by email should you, if you don't want to ask a question now, I'm happy to, to answer them or direct you to the appropriate person. Any last minute questions? I'll just say thanks for attending. Um, you know, uh, I think, you know, what you need to do as graduate, uh, what you're thinking about graduate studies is really do your research and find out what you want to do and where you think the best program is. So. These sessions, I think, are really helpful, and I'm glad that everyone has attended. Um, and we're we're here to help. So please, if, should you have any questions or if anything is unclear, please reach out. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Are you? I'll stop recording. Thank you.